Thank you. As I was beginning to research writing the essay for the book, uh, I had to take a look at a rather interesting account of a strike in England, the Bliss Tweed Mill strike uh, in the same year as the lockout. And it caught my attention for two reasons. The first is that it was described in the local Oxfordshire press as Murphyism in Oxfordshire. And the second one is the mode of action that was going on. This was newly organised workers attempting to get recognition for their trade union, a strike that took place amidst violence, arrests, jailings, and a considerable degree of hysteria amongst the local employers. Now, the first point reminds us that the Dublin lockout had an international context, but also that that context importantly included the very complicated relationship with Britain. Secondly, the action in Dublin and in Oxfordshire. We find common grievances, union building mechanisms, and it reminds us how dangerous and how fraught was the process that workers faced, not just in Ireland or the UK, but internationally, enforcing their own concerns onto the political stage with their own organisations, their own agenda, and on their own terms. And it's in that light that I want to make a few remarks this afternoon uh, about the international experience. And that international experience actually is broader than 1913. We could talk, I suppose, of three major surges in working class organisation and struggle um, from the late 1880s up to the beginning of the slump in the 1930s. And our story really concentrates on the second of those waves. During the second of those waves in the UK, in the years between 1910 and 1914, there was a strike movement of such proportions that it earned the label of the great unrest. Now, that term is disputed amongst historians, but I'm going to cheat, my first cheat of the afternoon, and I'm going to apply, uh, apply it indiscriminately to the entire series of events crossing Europe, America, Australia, and South Africa uh, during these years. Dick Geary tells us uh, about Europe. He says, what contemporaries would have noticed more than any other thing about labour activity in the three decades before the First World War was the increase in the incidence uh, of strikes and of their scale. There were major series of strikes in France between 1905 and 1908, uh, and again in 1910-12, in Germany between 1910 and 1914, as well as in Italy and in Russia, between 1902 and 4, there were general strikes in Belgium, Italy, the Netherlands and Sweden, and strikes reached a peak in Spain in 1913. In America, a rising tide of industrial action led to the establishment of a state commission on industrial relations, which some 20, 30 years later actually came to some conclusion uh, in legislation to assist collective bargaining. Its history speaks of near anarchy and military rule in parts of America in the years 1910 to 1915. In 1910 alone, we saw the Bethlehem steel strike, a cloakmaker strike, the Chicago clothing worker strike, a Los Angeles strike wave, a general strike in Philadelphia. Somewhat later in 1919, the government in Canada established a royal commission on industrial relations on foot of what was described as the Canadian Labour Revolt. So we see a pattern across continents, across countries, of workers struggling to establish a voice in a hostile capitalist society. Now, it'd be foolish, and I don't want to pretend to do it, it'd be foolish to say that Dublin was somehow um, a subordinate front in a wider battle between labour and capital. But it was set within this broader movement. It was set in a movement that crossed continents. It was part of this great mobilisation. And furthermore, the formation of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, its survival through the lockout, was of course a decisive step uh, in establishing an independent labour movement in Ireland. And that's why the lockout had its unique features and its unique place in Irish history. It can't, I think, be wholly understood or fully 
Its significance cannot be fully understood, simply exclusively as an Irish event. Now, across the world, pundits, politicians, Labour leaders even, were asking in the face of this wave of militancy, how do we get to this stage? How do we get here where there is apparently an explosion of social struggle? And very often the answers that they proposed said very little. They said there was misery. They said there's demagoguery. And they said because of the scale of the conflicts, there's some kind of fever that has gripped people. And with all the impetuosity and irrationality that fever implies. Now for the workers who were engaged in these struggles, it was a bit different. The drive to organise and the insistence on solidarity were rooted in poverty wages and in competition between workers themselves. G.D.H. Cole, the English socialist who wrote about the Bliss Tweed Mill strike, said its significance was this. Until the country worker is better off, because this mill was on the edge of a small town in a rural district, till the country worker is better off, he will always be tempted into the town to take the place of any town worker who tries to raise his wages. Solidarity was not just a principle, it was a practical attempt to undermine inter-worker competition. Now, historians of the transport strikes in the UK, in Europe, and in America, too, emphasise the connections between poverty on the one hand and powerlessness and growing militancy. Coates and Topham tell us for um, the Liverpool strikes, some historians have felt that the uprising of the ports in 1911, the huge strike wave in Britain in the ports, remains mysterious. The only mystery, they say, is why it took so long. After years of privation and oppression, the seamen, dockers and carters left their work in droves. But misery, after all, was scarcely in short supply in those years. Something more was happening. In contrast to the dock strike in London in 1889, which took place during the Great Economic Depression of those years, the strike wave, the Great Unrest, took place in what was in more boom conditions. Growing employment, um, moderately rising prices, but also, from the capitalist point of view, declining productivity. Declining pro productivity meant declining profitability. This mixture of influences proved to be explosive. In old established industries, workers faced driving and rationalisation as, as the bosses attempted to maintain profit margins. In many of the more modern industries, they faced work reorganisation, technological change and speed up of production. As a consequence, relations between workers at work and their managers began to change quite significantly. And relations between workers themselves also began to change. Hyman tells us that skilled workers were antagonised and aggrieved, but retained a good deal of collective strength, while unskilled workers achieved a new ability to transform long-standing grievances into organised militancy. And it's that ability to transform grievance into action that underlay uh, the lockout, uh, uh, the growth of the ITGWU in Dublin and Murphy's attempt to wreck it. Similar forces can be seen at play, for example, in France and in Germany. Most strikes in those countries in this period, as most strikes everywhere, I guess, were about pay. But they also included th disputes over discipline at work, effort levels at work, speed up at work. Metal workers in the Ruhr Valley complained in one of their strikes of nervous exhaustion from coping with technological change in the industry and speed up. So similarities in conditions and similarities produce similarities of grievance. And this fueled trade union organisation and solidarity. The radical union leader Tom Mann analysed the labour process on the London docks. He talked about rationalisation, speed up, and with this the evils of casualisation and no possibility of steady work. He concluded, and it's an important conclusion, he said, there's only one set of people that can do anything about this. It's the dockers. If the dockers don't do it for themselves, nobody will do it. And that was the starting point for many of the radical trade union organisers of the day. Man's observation on sweating and dehumanisation were echoed almost exactly by Connolly, one year later, 
in an expose of labour conditions on the Belfast docks. He wrote, As a result of systematic slave driving, the average day's work was driven higher and higher until 160, 180 and 200 tonnes a day's work ceased to excite any comment or be seen in any way as remarkable. Now the Bliss Mill Tweed strike work would have understood this very well. When they paraded through uh, Chipping Norton, the town of the location of the mill, they carried their banner declaring, we fight for liberty, down with oppression. The other aspect of this wave of union organising was that it always tended to look beyond the horizon of the immediate dispute and recognise that the grievances workers had were not just incidental but rooted in their lack of power in society. Now, if misery and a desire for human dignity is all that's required for social change, we'd all be in a different place now. We have to think how workers' fighting capacity was mobilised and expressed. Transport workers played a, a particularly important role in the UK, in Ireland, and across Europe as well. In Ireland in particular, as Emma O'Connor has argued, relative economic backwardness on the one hand, coupled with the growing importance of the transport industry on the other, meant that unskilled general workers in some ways were better placed to get something from the bosses than many other groups, the first point. Secondly, that the new general unionism of the Irish transport workers was the best tool they had to hand. And thirdly, that success in the transport sectors allowed the union to build a bridge to general workers more broadly uh, in other occupations and industries. Now that bridge depended on workers' own organisation and was grounded in solidarity. Solidarity as a practical necessity. It was the only tool that many of these workers had that was effective. It wasn't dreamt up um, as, a, as a form of nice thinking about being working class. It was a practical necessity in a battle with the employer. Now, Annie Cooper was a Bliss Tweed Mill worker. She was on strike for union recognition. She'd worked for that company for 20 years. Passing the mill during the strike, she saw a scab up a ladder. So she pulled down the ladder and the scab with it. And... Shocking, isn't it? So, she was fined for assault, but she said, I'm not paying any bloody fine for assault. That was a scab. So she was jailed for 14 days. When she was released, she was met by a crowd of over a 1,000. She was paraded through the town with her entire family. She was followed by a brass band, and the workers' union presented her with a silver teapot. <laughs> now, that's not such a surprise either. The workers' union organiser that was organised in the Bliss Mill strikers, who were largely women, Herself, a woman, who'd been a, a, a branch secretary of the workers' union since she was 16 years old, and who herself actually was jailed for suffragette activities at one stage as well. Many newly organising workers depended for their effectiveness on novel and sometimes very public demonstrations of solidarity. Now, in Ireland generally, and Connolly writes about this, and Francis does it himself on all occasions, the role of song was important in binding workers together. In the 1910 Pennsylvania miners' strike, the wives of the striking miners, uh, many of them got arrested for harassing strike breakers and the company's security personnel. Mother Jones, uh, who was the, one of the mine workers' organisers, an organiser for the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW, and originally from Cork, as it happens, Mother Jones told the women, go to the sentencing and take your children. When the judge was faced with these people, he had no choice. He wanted to put them in jail. There was no one to look after the kids. They sent the mothers and the children to jail. Mother Jones then told the women, sing, sing to the children, sing all night, until the neighbourhood around the jail got so fed up with the racket <laughs> that they all let out. Well, the Bliss Mill strikers in England infuriated local opposition with their frequent marches, street collections, and so on. A letter from local business people to the Oxfordshire Weekly News complained of processions parading the streets, singing a variety of battle songs of various descriptions, 
largely comprised of a female element, raising their voices to the highest possible pitch. Now, innovations such as these in visible communal forms of solidarity weren't just ephemera. They also led, during this period, to quite important institutional innovations. The formation in the UK of the National Transport Workers Federation in 1910, which incidentally refused to let in the Irish Transport Union because it was considered a breakaway union from the British Union, uh, brought together 16 unions. And it was not only part of the wider later amalgamation movement, it was a key weapon in organising the strikes of those years and it was a key centre of support for Dublin workers during 1913 amongst the British trade unions. These struggles also found expression in new methods of struggle so that the historian Cronin argues the fundamental strategic innovation of 1910-1914 was the sympathetic strike. The fundamental innovation. Wildcat strikes were common and these were used to extend the field of combat so that a dispute in a workplace became a dispute in a district and even sometimes a dispute at national level. The railwaymen were particularly active in this kind of spreading um, of strike action. But so were the semi-skilled engineering workers of the English Midlands. Hyman tells us that the engineering workers in the Midlands extended solidarity, as he put it, to unskilled workers and women workers, such that the weakest sections gained large advances with the support and perhaps even at the cost of their stronger comrades. Now, I've talked a little bit about workers' discontents uh, and their struggles, but of course the employers were scarcely bystanders in this process, so I want to spend a little time on them. For the press to speak of Murphyism in Oxfordshire is to acknowledge the organised anti-union role of employers and their political allies. And that's important for two reasons. Firstly, there's a tendency to speak of class struggle as something that workers do to employers from time to time. Not at all. It's the default mode of the capitalist class, however modified by political expediency or the strength of organised labour. Secondly, the great unrest was distinguished, the historians tell us, by unusual levels of violence, not only in picket line clashes, but in attacks on managers, ideas in people's heads, and attacks on property. And it's a feature that contributes a great deal to the notion that the great unrest was a great fevered outburst of emotional and irrational response from workers. The iconic event here in the UK setting, or many other settings in other countries, was the burning out of the whole docks in 1911 uh, by a crowd of striking uh, dockers. Likened by one horrified, if well-travelled, local councillor uh, as being reminiscent of events in the Paris Commune. What particularly upset him, I understand, were the number of women involved in setting fire to warehouses. He didn't think it quite, quite the thing for women to do. In fact, violence was a leitmotif of the great unrest, but principally as a tool used by employers and employers' organisations against workers. Prior to the First World War, across Europe, certainly, to an extent in America, certainly in the UK, we see the growing of effective nationwide employers' organisations. In Germany, employers benefit, benefited from what they called a strategy of conflict, a class struggle imposed from above. Arbitrary police bullying, partisan court rulings, jailings and the like. In the UK, the Shipping Federation, Murphy's Dublin Employers Organisation, Lord Davenport's Free Labour Organisation in London, were counter-mobilisations against workers' organisations. Politically, economically, they were characterised by aggression, often by violence, whether exercised by the troops, police, or by armed free labour. The use of violence, of course, wasn't limited to this period that we're considering. Hull seemed to have a bad time of it. During the 1893 dock strike, 
Uh, Parliament heard complaints that employees of the Shipping Federation, that is to say hired strike breakers, have been setting off pistols uh, on the hull docks. And the use of this kind of violent suppression of trade unions was very common. Sergio Segui, I don't really know how to pronounce the Spanish word, but Sergio, the leader of the Barcelona Workers' Committee in the 1917 general strike and insurrection, was shot dead in the streets in 1923 by gunmen from the employers' organisation, the Sindicato Libre, the Free Syndicate. Now, the employers, of course, could also rely on the state to use, as one historian put it, a little persuasion with the bayonet. In Liverpool, during its own bloody Sunday, 350 people were hospitalised after police and troops attacked a mass strike meeting in the city centre, and troops shot and killed two workers in a separate incident a couple of days later. In the same month, workers blockading a struck railway line in Hledesley in South Wales uh, were fired upon by troops from the Worcestershire Regiment and two were killed. The troops had been ordered up by Thomas Jones, who was a Justice of the Peace in Flanathley and a shareholder in the Great Western Railway. That line is on the Carmarthen line, and that was also interesting from the politician's point of view. It was a very sensitive railway line, being seen as the main route to and from the troubled provinces of Ireland. Force was also a familiar story in the coalfields of Australia and America. The struggle of American miners for union organisation were notoriously met by state and employer violence on a scale unimagined in the UK. In a series of vicious disputes on the railways, in the mines and elsewhere, US employers used troops, state troops, county police, city police and armed strike breakers in a murderous campaign of union suppression typified by the Ludlow Camp horror when state troops machine-gunned an encampment of striking miners and their families. The Pennsylvania State Police were particularly active in this kind of area. They were popularly known as the Cossacks, uh, but incidentally, they had been designed and fashioned along the lines of Britain's Royal Irish Constabulary because conditions in Pennsylvania resembled those of strife-torn Ireland. So work of violence in the great unrest was real enough, but it was principally defensive. In the Dublin lockout, of course, the workers' defence was distinguished by the most daring and systematic development of the citizen army. In any event, workers worldwide, from the Broken Hill miners in Australia to the gold miners in South Africa to the Lawrence strikers in America, would have recognised and understood the performance of a docker's prayer in London in 1912, God strike Lord Davenport dead. Okay, so we've looked at the misery and we've looked at the fever a little bit. What about the demagoguery? Strikes result from a clash of economic and class interests, but they're organised, directed, won or lost by men and women. And these bring the force of ideas to the organised struggle that they engage in. In Dublin, employers cursed the influence of Larkinism, and it had its echoes in the UK. Elsewhere in Europe and in America, employers cursed class war unionism and syndicalism. In England, the Times produced a whole series of articles uh, around this idea of the syndicalist label, revolutionary trade unionism, as the cause of all the troubles being felt uh, in the great unrest. Now, I can't engage with that debate over syndicalism today. It's long, it's contemplate, uh, complicated, it's interesting, but it's beyond my scope. So I'm going to cheat again, my second piece of cheating. I'm going to use it as simply synonymous for the time being as a catch-all term for the radical trend inside the trade unions. Now, there are some key characteristics if we make this usage of syndicalism. First, there's the influence of socialist think thinkers, principally Marxists, but also in France and America, some anarchists, who are hostile to the existing structure and practice of trade unions insofar as they were craft-based or in other ways exclusive, and so added the burden of sectionalism to the already horrendous problems of worker organisation. There was also, in this 
field of thought, widespread dissatisfaction with the partial and unstable results of political organisation uh, that was exclusively parliamentary in orientation. Thirdly, these defects impelled unions, in the eyes of their critics, to adopt a self-defeating moderation that led not only to a failure to make economic advances, but guaranteed the continuing subordination of workers as individuals and as a class. Now, it's worth adding, since we hear from contemporary 1913 commentators, and we still hear it sometimes today, that syndicalist or syndicalist-minded trade union leaders were not reckless in their approach to industrial disputes. They were not wholly averse to mechanics of conciliation and dispute settlement. But they did argue that workers' emancipation lay in the widest, most inclusive form of union organisation, in solidarity and in direct action, and ultimately in the control of industry by the workers themselves. That are the key notes around this notion of a syndicalist approach to trade union purpose and action. Of course, it has to be said that in Pennsylvania in 1910, in Liverpool in 1911, in Dublin in 1913, workers who followed De Leon, Mann, Larkin, were not necessarily endorsing the socialist or syndicalist ideas of their leaders, although many of them were. Many of them were. Syndicalism, in this sense, never really conquered the trade union movement uh, in America, UK or Ireland. And the idea that the great unrest in the UK in particular was somehow some kind of syndicalist semi-insurrection really doesn't hold water. But, as Holton has argued, the syndicalist outlook resonated with the activity and outlook of very large numbers of workers in those years who adhered in practice to the primary importance of direct action over parliamentary pressure and the desirability of industrial solidarity between workers in different industries. Now, these sentiments challenged many trade union leaders. These were sentiments that many established trade union figures found it hard to swallow. <coughs> As did the fact that in these years, many disputes were unofficial in their origins. Now, while a Larkin or a man <coughs> could work with such explosions, many union leaders couldn't. The new methods adopted by workers were seen, uh, as expressed at the time, as a calculated repudiation of contemporary labour leadership, both political and within the trade unions. Now, why was that? Well, solidarity always tends to overflow the boundaries of the particular dispute uh, that starts things off. It overflows the bounds established by unions in agreements with employers. And everywhere, these kinds of movements challenge established procedures for settling disputes. Many workers were engaged in direct action or sympathetic action in breach of their own agreements with the employer on the use of conciliation and dispute resolution. And it's perhaps that many workers in engineering in particular had such conflicts with their own leaders that accounts for the particular influence of some of these socialist and syndicalist ideas in the older trade unions. Now, in the great unrest, when we, without going to the details of the numerous disputes, on occasion, trade union leaders managed to put together a package that satisfied the immediate demands of the strikers. But in England, in three trade-wide cases, in mining, in textiles, and in building, settlements were engineered against the direct opposition of the members. Such disputes between the authority of central union officials on the one hand and the activists and local members on the other meant that the entire period between 1910 and 1914 saw the amalgamated society of engineers in the throes of a bitter internal struggle. For many militants, therefore, these years also were to entrench a distrust of the trade union official that was to colour the development of workplace unionism uh, into the 
First World War years and beyond. Now, according to Murphy, he was a, a, an engineering shop steward and a founding member of the British Communist Party. To be again the officials was as much a part of the nature of a syndicalist-minded worker of that time as to be again the government was part of the nature of an Irishman. <laughs> now, these questions are important, not because they offer some instant historical lesson for today. They don't. But they do help us explore relations between English and Irish workers and English and Irish unions in the setting of the lockout. We asked, wrote Connolly, for the isolation of the capitalists of Dublin and for answer, the leaders of the British labour movement proceeded calmly to isolate the working class of Dublin. Now Connolly's uncompromising, bitter analysis of the end game of the lockout and the role of the British TUC was probably as significant in its way for the development of the union movement in Ireland as the lockout itself. It was, of course, the practice of sympathetic action that so angered the Dublin employers. And the Young Irish Transport Union used such tactics widely. Uh, writing in the English Daily Herald, Connolly not only defended the use of a sympathetic strike, but recounted the victories of other unions, including skilled workers' unions, who had succeeded because of the intervention of the Irish Transport Union. And yet betrayal wasn't the whole story either, as Connolly acknowledged himself. The dramatic support for workers in Dublin, we've heard about uh, the intervention in the Kiddies campaign, for example, can be seen in the Fiery Cross campaign conducted by Larkin uh, across Britain uh, after his release from jail in November 13. His first appearance in Manchester not only filled the hall that was hired, 20,000 people were in the streets outside who couldn't get access to the hall. Meetings followed in every principal city in England and Scotland and Wales. The meeting in London was addressed, amongst others, by Big Bill Haywood, the American miners' leader and founder of the IWW, fresh from France with a cheque for 1,000 francs from the French syndicalists to support the Dublin workers. Concrete support also came from the British TUC and its affiliated unions in the form of money and food ships. Greaves commented that the Dublin workers looked for solidarity, but they got charity. Well, if so, it was charity on a substantial scale. And the response of British workers was notable. Aside from the records of what the TUC and affiliated unions gave, Money was raised by local levies on members in local branches, by collections at street meetings uh, and other rallies. £150,000 odd was raised in support of the Dublin workers, and that was a shed load of money in 1913. Larkin's tour of Britain brought in a lot of that money. But his urgent message wasn't for money. It was for sympathetic industrial action. And so we have to ask, given his enthusiastic reception. What stopped the solidarity action? Now, one account from the 1950s uh, actually claimed that the British railway and transport workers, hardly recovered from their own recent struggles, were in no position to undertake any such commitment. I'm not sure that's true. I'm not sure that it could be proven. Greaves' account, I think, is perhaps more convincing, although overstated. He says the British wanted to settle, but the Irish wanted to win. But if there were to be industrial action in England, the TUC officials would have to give up the role of mediators and adopt the role of combatants. And he commented, the arch opponent of any such action was the railwoman's leader, J.H. Thomas. Now, Thomas wasn't alone. Sexton, the General Secretary of National Union of Dock Labourers, the man who fired Larkin from that union and indirectly helped establish the Irish Transport Workers' Union, had been against the Dublin strike from the start. The Siemens leader, Havelock Wilson, publicly attacked Larkin and Larkinism in the British press, much to Connolly's disgust, since, as Connolly argued, it had been the Irish Union which had rescued the British Union during the strikes of 1911. Now, Thomas had long argued with his members that this 
fashion for sympathetic action would simply mean railwomen always being on strike. Because you're in the middle of the transport sector, you can't evade it. But really, leaving aside the rhetorical flourishes, perhaps what was moving Thomas more, he had in mind gaining recognition for his union from the railway employers. And the best way he could do that, in his view, was to put a big ditch between the railwomen's union and syndicalism, taken as being the word for aggressive trade unionism of the period. And he got what he wanted. In 1914, he got the first official recognition of his union from a railway company. Now, what's noticeable is not all of Thomas's members agreed with him. Three workers at Victoria Street Station in Liverpool were sent home for following Larkin's advice to boycott all Dublin traffic. When they were sent home, the entire workforce worked out, and the strike spread to the docks, and then to Birmingham, and then to Derby, and then to Gloucester. There's a disconnect, it might seem, between, on the one hand, an enthusiastic response to Larkin and sporadic industrial action in support of the Dublin workers and the inability to get official action sanctioned by the TUC. Beyond personal antipathy and rivalries, of which there were many, incidentally, um, we need to express the viewpoint of the leaders of the British TUC. We've seen how competing conceptions of union purpose and union organising were already expressed inside the movement in the UK during the Great Unrest. Apparently unstable, voluntarist actions, sympathy strikes, wildcat strikes on the one hand, and the attempt by some trade union leaders to put the genie back in the bottle and reach some kind of accommodation um, with the employers. And of course, while the state was active, it wasn't always using the bayonet. Okay? The Department of Trade in the UK, um, the various state departments of labour in the US, uh, the various uh, government departments in France and Germany all had some attempt to build some kind of dispute resolution or conciliation mechanism. And George Asquith, who was appointed uh, to try and find a solution to the 1913 lockout, was described by uh, Ben Tillett, a Dockers leader in England, as the most dangerous man in the country because he was the man that could convince workers they had a stake in capitalist society. There's a report uh, in Liverpool of children running down the street at the solution of one dispute, crying, we've won, we've won, the government man's coming, because Asquith was coming into town to broker a solution. Now, the conference of the TUC, the extraordinary conference that Francis has referred to, extraordinary not only in title, but as he said, extraordinary because it was the first such conference uh, since the foundation of the TUC, met in December. The TUC had been trying to broker a deal with a section of the Dublin employers, but Larkin wouldn't agree to it until he was sure of the policy of the British unions. And so he proposed calling a conference of all the unions to consider solidarity action, and the TUC did it. That's what the extraordinary conference was for. The delegates would be accepted from affiliated unions and Labour members of Parliament, and that decision excluded the Irish unions who were not affiliated to the British TUC, it incidentally excluded the British Engineering Union, because they hadn't got around to paying their subs that year. And it also excluded the National Transport Workers Federation because it wasn't actually a trade union. And so Greaves' argument was that the TUC Special Conference was made up, as he put it, largely of the obedient official element of their own stamp. Now, not all historians agree. Porry Yates uh, has argued strongly that the nature of the conference delegates enabled the TUC, that, that the nature of the conference delegates enabled the TUC to avoid engaging in solidarity action is mistaken. That there was nothing irregular about the composition um, of the conference, and it consisted largely of the same people who had been so supportive of Dublin at the TUC's regular meeting in September. There are competing views on the end game of this dispute. In the event that special conference was calamitous, for the Irish Transport Unions, dominated by recriminations and personal attacks. 
and a confused debate. Proposals for continued financial support for the Dublin strike vied with proposals for new conciliation attempts and a crucial amendment from the gas workers which called on the TUC to stop all traffic between the UK and Dublin and to levy all British trade union members in support of the Dublin workers was lost by 10 votes to one. That's a fairly decisive rejection uh, by that special conference of industrial solidarity. En route back to Dublin, Connolly read in the morning paper that Thomas's railway union had already ordered the strikers at Dublin's North Walkie back to work on pain of losing their strike pay. <coughs> the lack of industrial sympathy action from Britain, organised by the TUC and sanctioned by the TUC, wasn't just a question of animosity to the strikers or animosity to the individuals. It was part of a bigger struggle inside the trade union movement about the difference between the use of conciliation, arbitration, moderation in relation to the employers and an aggressive forward-looking policy. It replicated those divisions inside the trade union movement, which had been notable throughout the great unrest, in actually in all the countries where it existed, and distilled it in an argument about the fate of Dublin in 1913. So, what can we conclude, if anything? The Dublin lockout had an international context. It derived from a series of struggles between employers and workers across many countries, as the development of capitalism on an international scale drew new social forces into struggle, created new forms of trade union in the political party, and often re-energized and reinvigorated older forms of worker organization. That process was contained within the first decade and a half of the 20th century. And it didn't stop entirely either when World War threw the international scene into a bloodbath. Nothing in human history is accomplished quite as neatly as these periodizations might say. But it was a pivotal period. For many working class organizations, it was so pivotal that in the following decades, only fascism could threaten wholly to dissolve the gains of trade union recognition, collective bargaining, and a political space for workers' organizations that the great unrest created in Britain, in Ireland, continental Europe, America, and Australia. The Dublin lockout was the attempt by a combination of Irish employers to stall that process, to roll backwards all relations between workers and employers. And at huge human cost, and it's important to remember the costs of struggle as well as the heroism of struggle. At huge human cost, Murphyism ultimately failed in Dublin, just as ultimately it failed in Oxfordshire too. The Bliss Tweed Mill strikers got trade union recognition in 1945. Now, I mentioned the US Commission on Industrial Relations set up in 1912, and I want to quote from it because it seems to me there are words here that help us understand the significance of these events. The report said, We hold that efforts to stay the organisation of labour or to restrict the right of employees to organise should not be tolerated but that the opposite policy should prevail, and the organisation of trade unions and employers' organisations should be promoted. This country is no longer a field for slavery, and where men and women are compelled, in order that they may live, to work under conditions in determining which they have no voice, they are not far removed from a condition existing under feudalism or slavery. These were the terms of settlement, if you like, all other considerations aside, that the workers of Dublin and the workers of the Bliss Tweed Mill were seeking in 1913. So what's the legacy and what, what exactly should we be commemorating? The easy, optimistic answer, I suppose, is to see the establishment of peaceful, rule-governed systems of industrial relations as a necessary and welcome outcome of the battles of an immature industrial society. But it's much, much harder to make that case now in light of developments both nationally and internationally since 2008. 
The optimistic answer is less easy now, not just because of recession, unemployment and austerity, but because these phenomena, the recession, unemployment and austerity, increasingly disrupt the idea that there's a single we to commemorate 1913. Here again, for all the national specifics, Ireland occupies, occupies its own space in international development. Not this time of work as advance, but of a reassertion of the power, logic and ethics of free market capitalism and the powers of its owners and its ideologues. The terms of that reassertion aren't, of course, new. They never really went out of fashion. Friedrich von Hayek, a uh, principal source of neoliberal advice to the Thatcher government in Britain, argued the two alternatives to the market, collectivism and syndicalism, right? that does for labour and the trade unions, destroy not only wealth but freedom, whereas the market virtually eliminates coercion of men by men. In Ireland, throughout the European Union for that matter, trade union recognition is in decline. And the weakest in the labour market are losing protections of collective bargaining, casualisation, privatisation, subcontracting, the commodification of social goods in health and education, austerity, labour market reform, all combine to undermine those institutional structures largely built around trade unions, which ensured that the employer-employee relationship is not primarily determined by market forces. What should be remembered from 1913 is that workers have their own interests. These interests are separate from those of the employers, that the employers will use whatever means they can to subvert or destroy these interests, and that the capacity of workers to determine the outcome in any other direction depends fundamentally on their own organisational capacity and consciousness. Thank you.